Hi there, John Wilkinson here and History Made Easier. And this talk I'm going to title An Unprecedented Upheaval. You'll see why in just a second. And I'm going to explain the utter chaos, the absolute mess that Europe was in after World War I. And I think it will provide a really strong context to topics that you might well be studying, the work of the League of Nations, the rise to power of Mussolini, the rise to power of Hitler, or the causes of World War II. This is the context to all those things. The unprecedented upheaval comes from a, 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 a sentence right at the beginning of Stephen J. Lee's book, The European Dictatorships. It's a book your school might well have. Because he says, Europe experienced between the wars an unprecedented upheaval. That's how he begins his book. But I can give you um, the titles of some other books that I have that give you a flavour of what historians think about the interwar period. E. H. Carr wrote a book, The Twenty Years' Crisis. R. J. Overy wrote a book, The Interwar Crisis. And by the way, these are all top historians for this period. Sally Marks, who I'm going to quote from, um, a book I have but I can't find, uh, she wrote a book, The Illusion of Peace. And then another book that I'm going to quote from that I have on Kindle, uh, Ian Kershaw's To Hell and Back. That's what he thought of the interwar period, To Hell and Back. I'm going to begin with some statistics. First of all, from a, 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 a broad perspective, and then I'm gonna hone in on some statistics from Germany. Germany is, after all, at the heart of so much that happens in Europe after World War I. So some statistics, 65 million men were conscripted into different armies in World War I. They didn't all fight, but most of them did. And out of that 65 million, one in eight died. One in eight. Two in eight, or one in four, that's how good my maths is, were seriously wounded. One in four of 65 million seriously wounded. And if you add another dimension to this post-war Europe, the world was undergoing a flu pandemic at the tail end of the war and in the post-war period. Millions and millions died of the flu. Now we know something about pandemics today, but this flu pandemic really was much, much worse than what we're going through with COVID. Some German statistics, 1,700,000 Germans died. Some analyses put it at over 2 million. So at least 1,700,000 Germans died. On top of that, 650,000 were seriously wounded. And out of them, 2,400 were blinded, 65,000 amputees, and 1,300 double amputees. That was the price of war for Germans. But there's still more. 
300,000 Germans suffered from shell shock. So physical injuries, psychological injuries, the price of war, and that's just one nation. There was an economic impact as well. Trade had been disrupted, inflation occurred at, during the war and again in the post-war period. National savings were wiped, wiped out. Debts mounted, national debts. And of those eight million or more men who died in World War I, they were workers, they were consumers, they were taxpayers. And many of those men were married and had children. And so states had war pensions to pay out to those widows to help them and their young families survive. And these are states that have had their savings wiped out and their debts mounting. This is the price of war. Let me give you a little extract from Ian Kershaw's book that looks at Britain and the price, the Britain, the economic price and social political price that Britain paid. I'm going to read you not too long a section. Early demobilisation of the soldiers in Britain had been fairly smooth. From three and a half million at the armistice in 1918, the army fell in size to 370,000 men by 1920. An immediate post-war economic boom meant that by the summer of 1919, four-fifths of the soldiers had been discharged and most of them had found work. But four-fifths means that six, seven hundred thousand men hadn't found work. And by the way, a lot of those men only found jobs because women were pushed back out of the economy. But the boom ended as quickly as it began. By the autumn of, 1940, uh, of 1920, it was over. Deflationary policies, policies to reduce um, inflation, to, to try and avoid inflation, had a drastic effect on living standards. Wages, which had initially kept up with rising prices, fell sharply. Class tensions remained. In 1919, 35 million days have been lost in industrial disputes, strikes. 35 million working days lost. In 1921, the figure was 86 million. 86 million days lost due to strikes. Unemployment doubled over the three months from December 1920 to March 1921. By the summer, two million were without work. Most of the unemployed lived in squalid, dilapidated accommodation. Homes for heroes had been promised in 1918, but by 1923, more than 800,000 new houses were needed just to cover the basic housing shortage, let alone replace the millions of desolate slum dwellings. By 1921, countless former soldiers, many of them badly disabled, were living in dire poverty begging on the streets or trying to eke out a living by selling matches and mementos, eating at food kitchens provided by charities, 
sometimes forced to sleep in doorways or on park benches. These are the men who had risked their lives for their country. We were no longer heroes. We were simply unemployed, was one former officer's bitter commentary. That's happening in Britain. It's happening all over Europe. Okay, let's have a look at the political impact. Empires are gone. The German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, gone. The Russian Empire, seriously pegged back. They'd lost a lot of, of territory. And in their place, successor states. I'm going to read them out for you. Finland, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania in the Baltic. Poland, Czechoslovakia, as well as the reconstituted Austria and Hungary in Central Europe. And Yugoslavia and the much enlarged Romania, as well as the reconstituted Turkey in the Balkans. There were revolutions. Russia, before the war ends, revolution in Germany, revolution in Hungary. And when I read from Sally Marx, you'll see that there were more than that. And even amongst the winners, we talk about, or Italians rather, talked about the mutilated victory. So, you know, Europe has been radically changed. Its borders radically altered, redrawn. Empires gone, new countries created. But it's not going to be an easy honeymoon period. Not at all. Continued division and turmoil, both in Europe and in the world. You know, things you know about. The Russian Civil War, Manchuria, fascism rising with Mussolini and Hitler, Abyssinia, the Spanish Civil War. And this is where I turn to Sally Marx. This is what she writes in The Illusions, The Illusion, rather, of Peace. The advent of peace was highly relative. The major powers were no longer in bloody collision, but civil war raged in Russia, Ireland, China, Turkey, and briefly in the Ruhr in Germany. Foreign troops remained in Russia. The Baltic area was a battleground, and Poland invaded Russia, while Hungary marched briefly on Poland, Romania and Slovakia. There was fighting on the Finnish frontier and in Fiume. In Silesia, Germans and Poles waged an undeclared war. Most Balkan borders were aflame. And in An Anatolia, the Turks fought the Greeks, backed by the British. Yet the world was officially at peace. Sally Marks. Now that is already an unprecedented upheaval, to keep pushing my point. It was already an unholy mess. And then along comes the Great Depression in the early 30s. The Wall Street crash, 1929. The Depression really hits in the years 30 to 33. I'm going to give some more statistics and again I'm going to give some broader statistics and then I'm going to hone in on Germany. The broader statistics. World industrial production down by 30%. We're making 30% less things than we used to. The extract of raw materials, getting iron ore or coal out of the ground, down by 19%. Trade in manufactured goods, the things we make, down by more than 40%. World food output, the things we eat, 
down by 11%. They are all big figures. Now to hone in on Germany, 5.6 million people unemployed in Germany in 1932. Now it's hard to say with absolute accuracy, but we think that would mean about 17 million Germans affected. Because one person unemployed means a wife has less money to put food on the table. Children are affected. Even with single workers, men or women, if they're living at home, it means less money is coming into the family budget. So about 17 million Germans affected by the depression. 30% of the workforce was unemployed. More than 50% in the age group 16 to 30 were unemployed. Now that's your age group. And this is the age group in which, you know, you've got, or you should have everything to look forward to. The world is your oyster. Well, not in the early 1930s. There is no sign of a job. You don't know when we're going to dig our way out of this nightmare. That's what they were facing. And of those 5.6 million unemployed and the 17 million who were affected, 60%, only, sorry, only 60% of, of that figure received normal relief. And normal relief only just helps you get by. But only 60% were receiving that. 15% were receiving nothing. That's how uh, the Great Depression affected Germans. And again, you can repeat that in countries all over Europe. So, I think I've done my job of giving you context to the issues that Europe faced in the interwar period and the issues that led us to World War II. And I hope I've given it a human dimension. Uh, behind statistics are people's lives. History is always, always, always about people. So I hope that was useful. As always, I do sincerely thank you for listening and I do remind you to check out my History Made Easier website and I'll put those statistics on there for you. But for now, cheers. <laughs>